Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. good? Very good. So, just procedural matters. Um, online homeworks continue to be due at regular intervals on Monday nights and Wednesday nights. That's the My Math Lab thing. Uh, then written homeworks are due every lecture. Uh, at the present time, there's two quizzes open, quizzes one and two. Uh, they're due at the close of business of the testing center on Saturday this week. Uh, quizzes one and two are over lectures one and two, respectively. Quizzes three and four will open next Monday, the coming Monday, and they'll be over lectures three and four, etc. Okay, so any question about any of that? Just rolling right along. <clears throat> um, so no, no questions about procedural matters. Okay, so then last time, uh, last time we were talking about the area between curves. So just as a reminder of what we had established, uh, we had established the following, that if I ask you to compute the area of this shape, so if that's A and that's B, <coughs> And then if this is uh, y is g of x, and if this is y is f of x, then that shape that's between those functions and also between those uh, vertical lines, that shape is not common enough in human experience to have a name like circle or something like that but nevertheless it has an area and moreover we have now established the formula for the area of that shape what's the formula for its area no that's the that's the formula for the area of a circle what's the formula for the area of this one Okay, almost. So that's definitely part of it. Integral from A to B. Which is saying that we're going to take that, that flag looking shape or whatever you want to call that and cut it into rectangles and then let the number of rectangles become infinite. That's what that's saying. <clears throat> okay. Well, a slight generalization, which is also a consequence of this, I could say, well, um, suppose we have this fence post and this fence post. And suppose that we have this function uh, g. So this red one is y is g of x. And suppose that we also have this green one. y is f of x. And suppose that I say, well, I want you to find all of this area. So that whole area. Well, how could we how could we go about doing that? Well, there's two points. 
it would be very much in our interest to find. What, what, what two points would be very much in our interest to find? Where they intersect, right? So we definitely would want this one and that one. So suppose that one way or another, we find where those are. And suppose now that we, we know the values of all of those fence posts, and let's say that they are A1, A2, A3, and A4. <clears throat> then you, you now have enough information to tell me the formula for the area that I've indicated. What is the formula for the area that I've indicated? Okay, so let me add one additional thing. I think it's clear enough that I could say that the, sh the shaded region, in a sense, consists of three pieces, right? One, two, and three. So what's the area for this one? Right, we need to integrate from A1 to A2 to find the area of this piece. So this would be integral A1 to A2. And are we supposed to integrate F minus G or G minus F and why? F minus G, why? Because F is the one that's on top. F, the green wavy one, is the one that's on top. So this would be f of x minus g of x dx. So this integral represents the area of that piece. How about the piece in the middle? g of x minus f of x, a to the x goes a to the x. Very good. So the meaning of the, of the limits of integration, what, what this is saying is that this is the furthest, this bottom one, this is the furthest left you are to be, ever. And the top one is saying this is the furthest right you are to be, ever. So from A2 to A3. And then, supposing you are in that region, yes, now the red one, G, is on top. <coughs> So that corresponds to that one. And then for the last region, plus another integral. And what are the limits? Very good. Very good. So what I want you to see is that, in principle, I could, you know, <laughs> make it really messed up, right? Just, just they're all crossing all over each other. You've got to find 12 intersection points. <laughs> I'd never do it, okay? Because in the main reason I would never do it is because it would be impossible to grade. That's why, <laughs> that's why. it would just be too much. <laughs> and, then it, and then what would be the point in demoralizing you like that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it would be just as demoralizing for me as for you. Okay, <clears throat> so another version of this exercise, which is, which is on the My Math Lab homework, I think, is um, a question that is like this. But what I want you to see is that, is that this question that I'm about to ask you is actually just a simpler version of this one. But several students have told me that they don't understand how to address the question. So, so suppose that this is the plot of y is f of x. So 
in, and in particular, that's the, the x-axis. Okay. And suppose, furthermore, that what I'm asking you to do is find the shaded area. <coughs> Okay. Now, <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to make this. I'm going to make this bottom one green, just so I can say green. Now, if you wanted to, <laughs> if you had some fence that was shaped like that, then you could paint it, right? And you might decide <coughs> to do it just like we've done it here. You might say, well, it just it occurs to me that I want this part of the fence to be graphite colored and I want this part of the fence to be green, okay? Then it would take so much paint, so much graphite paint to, to do this, and so much green paint to do that, okay? That's what's being asked. Now, there's a separate matter, and a separate and distinct matter of, if you were to integrate from A to B, if you were to do that, of this situation exactly as it is now, this area, would be reckoned as being positive, and, thi and this other area would be reckoned as being negative. But, but that's not the question that the homework is asking about. That's not what it's asking. It's saying, tell me the total area. So now, this horizontal line, it's the x-axis. What is the formula for the x-axis? y is zero. That's its formula, after all, right? So the, so the, the x-axis is a function. It's the function, it's the function, if you like, g of x equal to zero. No matter what x you give, the output is zero. Well, if you wanted to find the area of this region, and if this was value C, then how do you find the area of this region? Would it be, would it be, uh, so in the first place, what would be the limits of integration? A to C, right? For this one. You'd, integ you'd integrate from A to C. And then you're going to have to integrate top minus bottom. Well, what's top? And what's bottom? Zero. So if we refer to this as region one and this one as region two, uh, two, <laughs> the area of region one is the integral from A to C of f of x minus 0 dx. And of course, you wouldn't really, <laughs> you don't really write the minus 0, right? You just ignore that. Okay, then, then the uh, area of region 2 then, what would be the limits of integration? <coughs> C to B. And because it's always, when you're trying to find area, that is to say the positive, how much paint it would take, how much green paint it would take to paint it. And, it's, and because it's always top minus bottom, what are we integrating? And of course, you don't write 0 minus f of x. You just write negative f of x. OK? Which is just to say, because of the way the integral procedure is defined, because the function goes below the horizontal here, that means that this is reckoned as being negative. That's all that that means. But if I'm asking you to find the total area, that means that to find this area, you have to negate the answer from c to b. Good. Any question about this? 
Okay, so let's do one more of these kinds of problems. And um, then we'll move on to something else. So now, <coughs> I'm going to show you how these kinds of find the area between the function problems uh, is made. So I'm writing a little block. It's, it's hidden because this is me back in my office and you can't see what I'm doing. Okay. I'm imagining a parabola. So I'm imagining a parabola and this parabola has two zeros. And to make our life nice, I'm going to make the coordinates of the zeros be integers, and even better, I'll make them positive integers. And just so that things work out nice, I want them to be at least two apart. So could someone give me a smallish positive integer? Two. Okay. And I need another positive integer that's further to the right, that, that's at least two away. Okay, four. <laughs> Okay, so I want a parabola that does this. So how do I, how do I get a parabola that, that's exactly this way? How could I get one? So I'm not, I'm not sure I follow you, so how, what do I do? Uh-huh. Very good. So, so x minus 2 is one factor, and x minus 4 is another factor. So why should this work? Well, let's imagine for a moment. In this, in this uh, formula, if we were to substitute x is 2, then that factor right there would be 0, right? And it wouldn't make any difference what that one is, because that one would be 0. So then when x is 2, y is 0. That's what it means to be, to have an intercept right there. And the same argument goes for 4. If we were to plug in x is 4, then that factor would be 0. And it doesn't matter what the other one is. So that if you plug in x is uh, 4, then y is 0. So is everyone clear that this? This formula does that for us. Okay. So now, so there's, there's the parabola. So now let's come up with a line. So now this is just any old line that has positive slope. So let's say that it has slope 3. Would someone tell us the equation of a line that has slope 3? three x and then what else? Plus one. Okay, that's the first thing I heard. So three x plus one. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up I'm gonna set up uh, a situation where you where you have to solve an equation that more or less uh, goes like this. Parabola plus line is equal to line. So now, obviously, this is not an equation because that's not, that's not algebra, algebraic symbols. But supposing that these were, right, then what would you do to solve? Well, you could simplify it by, for example, subtracting line from both sides, right? Then you'd have parabola equals zero. Okay, well, let's see how this goes. <clears throat> Here's the question.
find the area between x is 0, x is 7. Oh, I need to multiply that out. So I'll go ahead and multiply this out. x squared minus 6x plus 8. Okay, so x is 0, x is 7. y is x squared uh, minus 3x plus 9. <coughs> and y is 3x plus 1. So, so we're going with the fiction that you can't see this little stuff that I wrote up here. Okay, But you, you can, so I hope that you have at least a slight wonderment as to why did I write that instead of the other one? Well, as the question proceeds, s stop me when you see why I did this instead of the other one. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute, as for their shapes. If you were to plot this, what would you get? A line. What kind of line? A vertical line at x is 0. In particular, this would be the y-axis, right? So this would be some, some vertical line. What would this one be? Another vertical line, except over at 7. What would this one be? A parabola. And how does it open? Up. Smiley face, right? Okay. And then what kind of thing is this? A line, and how does it slope? <laughs> Up. <laughs> I, I, I'm currently going with the fiction that we can't see that. Okay. <laughs> so, so somehow what I'm what this question is indicating is that between these four graphs, that one, that one, that one, and that one, some shape, some bounded shape, is singled out. And I'm asking you to tell me the area. Okay? So let's take the complicated ones first. That is, that is to say this one and this one. And we need to see what are the possibilities for these two. There's three possibilities about how those might interact with each other. So the one, the one that most students come up with immediately, so so these are the possibilities. It's like this. So it's a parabola, it opens up, and then the line cuts it twice. So it might look like that. What's another possibility? So, for example, hold the parabola, the red, fixed, and start moving the line up and down. What's another possibility? They could do it exactly once. But there's even another possibility. And what's that? May not at all. Might totally miss it. But those are the only possibilities. Right? If I pull the line down any further, it's, there's going to be zero 
intersections forever. There's only one way you can get a single intersection, and, and that is when the line happens to be a tangent line. It just so happens to be a tangent line. And then there's lots of ways you can get two intersections. So these are the three possibilities for how the parabola and the line might be situated. So the number of intersections for this one is two. There's two intersections there. For in this case, there's one. And in this case, there's zero. Those are all the possibilities. Now, I have a question for you. How do we figure out which case we're in? The vertical lines won't, won't, won't help you determine which case you're in. Yeah? That, that's a good thought. That's a good thought, but that's actually, that's actually not entirely true. Um, be, because this, this number, I, I could change this, this number, this one, to be such that it would, it would actually work. So how do we figure it out? Are there two, one, or zero intersections? There's a, there's a quick and unambiguous way to figure it out. This is a this is a college algebra matter. You set the equal to each other. You solve an equation. So to determine which case we happen to find ourselves in. Because I promise you, I can and will make it any of these cases. <laughs> to determine which case you're in, we're going to solve an equation. We want to solve x squared minus 3x plus 9 is equal to 3x plus 1. Okay. So what was the answer to my to my initial question? <laughs> Remember I said stop me when stop me when what did I ask you to do? <laughs> Stuck to this chair. Notice that this is the parabola that we started with, right? <coughs> so all that I did, right, I even, I told you what I was going to do. I said the thing that I gave you is actually the sum of the parabola and the line. And this equation right here, this one right here, is that one. The sum of the parabola and the line is the line. And so here we are with a quadratic. Does it factor? How does it factor? <laughs> Very good. So I'm, I'm sort of mm, playing it out like this because I want you to see exactly what it is that I'm doing when I go back to my office. It's not magical. Okay? I'm not, it's not some hidden skill or talent that I'm exercising. This is exactly what I'm doing. Okay, it's not by, it's when, you, when, you're, when your math instructor gives you exercises, it's not by luck that somehow everything turns out to be integers. It's, by, it's chosen <laughs> by design. Okay, so x is 2 and x is 4. So what bearing does this have on the, on the possible um, possibilities? So, so which, which does it turn out to be? Two, right? It turns out to be this one. Now, if this factorization, if we had got here to this factorization, and it was, say, 
x minus 5 multiplied by x minus 5. Or if you like, x minus 5 all squared. What would that indicate? There'd be just one solution. And then, if you came to a quadratic and you couldn't factor it nicely, or whatever, and then you use the quadratic formula and determine that the solutions are complex, then what? It means that they don't intersect. Okay? Good. So, as a result of this, the picture must look like this. So I'm drawing the parabola really wide so that my, I can draw a nice picture. Otherwise it gets too steep. So there's two intersections. What is this value? This one is 2. And this one? 4. Now, does this picture contain all of the information that we were given? There's yet more. What more? 0 and 7, right? So where are 0 and 7? in the picture. Okay, good. So, zeros over here say, right, this is not perfectly to scale. So zeros over there, and then seven is over here. Okay. <clears throat> so, so now that we have a picture drawn, could someone please tell us what is it that what is it that's being requested? Can you see what area it is that that's being referred to? I claim that it, it's three pieces. Does everyone see the three pieces? Yeah, it's this piece. plus this piece, plus this piece. And there's no other pieces that are bounded, right? For example, here's a piece down here. This, that is to say the piece that's down here, but it's unbounded. It goes all the way down. So I'm not talking about that piece. No, none of the other pieces are bounded. So if we give these pieces names, for example, call this piece number one, and this piece number two, and this piece number three, just, to get, just so we can refer to them by name. Would someone please tell us the formula for piece number one, the, the formula for the area for piece number one? Mm -hmm. Zero to two. Right. The parabola minus the line. Why the parabola minus the line? Because the parabola is on top in that region. So it would be x squared minus 3x plus 9 and then minus 3x plus 1 dx. Okay. What is the formula for the area of region 2? Two to four. Two to four. Yeah. And then what? 
Mm. Very good. So you're saying that now I should do line minus parabola? Why that? Lines on top. And then finally, the area of piece number three. What is the formula? <coughs> Four to seven. So x squared minus 3x plus 9 minus 3x plus 1. So is there any question why it, why it takes this shape, why the, why the answer must take this shape? So on an exercise such as this, Correctly drawing the shape and then coming up with the formula, the integral formula, like just, what, just what's presently written on the page is worth 7 out of 10 points. Okay, then if you go on to correctly integrate this one and that one and that one, that's the balance of the points. Okay, because honestly, this part is boring. Right? Doing, th doing this is just super boring. Because you perform the subtraction, okay, then you're integrating a polynomial with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Anyone can anti-differentiate a polynomial and then evaluate it at two points and subtract. Okay, that's, that's not a big deal. Correctly analyzing the situation to, to determine that this is what you're supposed to do, that's what's being graded, the primarily. Okay, so any question? So I'm not even going to do the rest of it. But do, do you understand that that this is what you'd have to do, and then evaluate these three, and then add them together. Good. Any questions about, uh, about this? OK. So now we're in a new chapter, chapter 8, section 1. And before I write down the title, I want to remind you of the basic, the generic roadmap of calculus. So for the first part of calculus, the first part of calculus, the main idea is that if you have a function that makes a, that makes a plot that's smooth, and if you go through the thought experiment of imagining that you're walking around on that plot, and if you make yourself very, very small in comparison to that plot, then if you're small enough and you're at a smooth place, then what you're walking around on looks like a line. It looks flat. Just like human beings are quite small in comparison to the Earth. So it looks like we're, wa we're walking around on a flat surface. It really does. Of course, that, that, of course, is not true at all if you go up in an airplane okay, and you can actually see the curvature of the Earth, or in a rocket, <laughs> where you can actually see the Earth in entirety. <laughs> so the calculus, the first half of calculus, the point of view, is that smooth objects locally are well approximated by straight lines, by straight things, flat things. And then, rather than saying, the best flat approximation to this function at that point, which is a mouthful, then what you do is you call that thing the tangent line or the tangent surface. Okay. And then, rather than saying slope of tangent line, what's the name for slope of tangent line? That secant line is one, is one thing. That's a separate matter. But there's a different name. There's a specific name that starts with D for slope of tangent line. Derivative. And then, so you come up with this name derivative. Then, derivative is defined in terms of a limit procedure, limits of secant lines. So rather than, rather than by hand, in a sense, compute limits of slopes of secant lines, we come up with all these procedures for how to compute derivatives of certain functions that are quite common, like polynomials and things like that. Okay, so we, you build up all this tangent 
derivative machinery in calculus one and you try and study all of its consequences. Then the beginning of calculus two is when you say, you know, it's nice, we've been using this derivative machine for a while. What would happen if we tried to do it in reverse? The name for trying to do the derivative procedure in reverse is antiderivative. And then you start going through that and imagining, okay, well, I guess I could do it in reverse. What would it be like if I did that? Then you start saying, okay, well, now we're going to talk about this un seemingly unrelated procedure. So you put aside antiderivatives and derivatives, and you say, here's a nice shape. I'd like to know its area. So then you, you take that shape and you cut it into rectangles and approximate its area with rectangles. And then you say, but that's just an approximation. And then you say, you know what? I think we could get it exact if we use infinitely many rectangles. So if you cut a shape into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles, compute all of their areas and sum them all up, that procedure is called integral. And then in one of the biggest surprises, to me anyway, even every time I teach it, one of the biggest surprises is that antiderivative and integral are intimately related. Running, the derivative machine is, is it, it calculates the slope of the tangent surface. That's what it's doing. Antiderivative is doing that process in reverse. Integral is cutting something up into pieces and summing them up. And then antiderivative and integral are related to each other through the fundamental theorem. That's just incredible. Okay. So, antiderivative. For every derivative rule, there's a corresponding antiderivative anti rule. Okay, so then derivatives have the sum rule, antiderivatives have the sum rule. Derivatives have the constant multiple rule, antiderivatives have the constant multiple rule. Derivatives have chain rule. But what's the corresponding thing for antiderivatives? Substitution. And what's the full name of, su of the substitution procedure? Variable. <laughs> Variable differential substitution. Variable differential change of. Uh, so, variable differential substitution, because you must change variables and also differentials. Okay, so derivatives have chain rule, antiderivatives have variable differential substitution. So what's another thing that derivatives have? Another rule, besides the sum rule, the constant multiple rule, the chain rule. What would be another one? The, the, which one? Power rule. So we have an antiderivative power rule. So we have that one. So what's another one? Quotient rule. Okay, so quotient rule we haven't talked about yet, right? We haven't talked about something that might correspond in antiderivatives to the derivative quotient rule. Okay, and we're not going to. <laughs> so <laughs> not directly anyway. So what, what's another thing that derivatives have? The exponential rule. And we have, we have an antiderivative exponential rule. So we have that one covered. So what's another thing that derivatives have? I'm going to run out here. <laughs> Coming right to the end. What's the one? There's like one left. Derivative of a sum, derivative of a difference, derivative of a quotient, derivative of a composition, that's chain rule. There's only one more. No takers. <laughs> a product, the product rule. Derivatives has, have a product rule. And so what we're going to talk about now is the, if you like, anti-product rule. How do, you do the anti how do you do the product rule in reverse? Okay? 
So the name for this, what your book calls it, your book calls it integration by parts, but I refuse to write that. And I'm going to call it anti-differentiation by parts. Okay, so here's the deal. <clears throat> it is that uh, we could compute the derivative of product UV. And we'd have to use the product rule. So it would be the derivative of U multiplied by V plus U multiplied by the derivative of V. So that's the product rule. So these, these things here, dV and dx and du and things like this, these are called differentials. That's the kind of thing that they are. And differentials are not fractions. And it is an error often to treat them as fractions, but in this particular case it is permissible. Uh, what I want you to tell me is what would happen if I multiply, in, you know, in scare quotes, multiplied both sides by dx? What would the left hand side be? It would be d uv equal, and then what? times v, and then plus u times dv. Okay, so that's multiplying all things by dx. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for this one. So just by moving the other one to the other side. So that would be d uv minus du v is u dv. So now I'm just going to switch the sides of the equation. So nothing's changing except I'm just swapping sides. So u <coughs> dv is d u v minus v, uh, d u v. I'm going to do one more thing. For this product, I'm going to commute it. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm going to take these two factors and I'm just going to swap their relative positions so that it is u d v is d u v minus v d u. And now, now, uh, I'm going to add antiderivative to the mix and get antiderivative u d v is the antiderivative of d u v minus the antiderivative of v du. And there's one last thing to be done, and that is that this operation right here, the elongated s, that's called the antiderivative. And we don't really talk about it in this class anyway, but this little d is actually its own operation, and it's called the differential. And these are opposites of each other in the exact same way that, for example, multiplication by two and division by two are opposites of each other. If you follow them up one by another, that's the same as having done nothing. So what I want you to see is that antiderivative of differential is the same as nothing, and those cancel. So that 
antiderivative of u dv is just uv minus the antiderivative of v du. <coughs> and this last thing, this is something you must memorize. So this is anti uh, derivative by parts. And then, if you find yourself not doing an antiderivative, but rather doing an integral, and, and this integral, you can use the fundamental theorem, then the corresponding integral is integral from a to b of u dv is product uv evaluated from a to b minus integral from a to b of v du. And this one is integration by parts. Okay. So there's, there's three things I want you to take away from this page. Two of them are those two formulas the red and the green formulas. So you've got you to have those. The other thing that I want you to take away from this is that the biparts formulas, they are, they are a consequence of the product rule. It's what happens when you do the product rule in reverse. That's what they are. OK. So any question about the formulas? OK. <clears throat> so let's have. Uh, an example. Okay, so then antiderivative of x exponential of 5x dx. Okay, so here we have a novel antiderivative. We're starting with a new antiderivative. So every time you start a new antiderivative, you've got to start at the top of the antiderivative procedure. So antiderivative procedure. So the first thing you do is you ask, is this a known antiderivative? So is it known? So how many antiderivatives do you know? You know three of them. That's it in this class. So the three that you know, <coughs> the three that you know are the power rule, x to n dx, well that's x to n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant. And what n's does that work for? Well, it works for constant ones, but there's a specific value of n for which this does not work. Negative 1. It doesn't work for n is negative 1 because this would require a division by 0, which is not defined. So in the case that the exponent n is negative 1, you're anti-differentiating anti x to negative 1, which you usually write as 1 over x. And we happen to have, we happen to know that one anyway. So what is it? Right, log of absolute value of x plus a constant. And then there's one more that we know. What is it? 
yeah, the antiderivative of the exponential is itself. Okay, so as for the antiderivative in the exercise, is this one of the known antiderivatives? So is that one of them? It's not. <laughs> it's not. The reason why it's not, so if, if it was just x by itself, if it was x by itself, then the answer would be yes. It's one of the known ones. If it was e to 5x by itself, the answer is yes. It would more or less be one of the known ones. Because you could do a simple substitution, and a 5 would come out, and then it would be just like this one. But none of these formulas say anything about a product. Okay, So, so this is not one of the known ones. The next step in the antiderivative procedure is can you do some kind of algebraic manipulation? So can you perform a sequence of algebraic steps to make it be one of the known ones? And the answer in this case is no, because I mean, you just can't algebraically simplify the product of a polynomial in an exponential. It just, there's nothing to do. Okay? So, if you can't do any algebraic steps, what's the next thing you check? You check a substitution. So can we do a substitution for this one? No. The substitution won't work because, you know, you could say, well, if you were to say u is x, that's not doing anything. <laughs> that's just changing the letter from x to u, right? And if you just really had a thing for like w's, you could, you could do w is x, and then now it would all be w's. But otherwise, your problem will be just the same. Okay, and you can't do uh, u is is anything. So if you're not if you're not sure about that, if you're not sure that a substitution simply will not work, then in your own time, I encourage you to to check it out. Try u is anything at all in this antiderivative. You're not going to make any headway. So then, here we are. We've added a new step to the procedure. Can I do it by parts? So by process of elimination, this is where we are. Probably not surprising, right? Because we're in the by parts section. Of course the one I gave you is going to have to be done by parts. OK. So as a result of that consideration, we're going we're to go by parts. Now, I'm going to write down the formula again for you so that you can look at it. It's antiderivative u dv is uv minus antiderivative v du. That's the formula. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to match this to this. So in particular, what, this, what I'm saying is that the thing we're anti-differentiating, we're going to say that something is u and something else is, and, and all the rest of the stuff is dv, because that's the way it is, right? So something's got to be u and all the rest of the stuff has to be dv. So now, I'm just, for now, I'm going to say, for reasons that I'm not going to share yet, I'm going to say that u is going to be x. Now, I will share the reason why, but for now, I'm not going to bother mentioning the reason why that's the case. So if u, if u is x, then what's dv? 
it's everything else. It's not just e to 5x. It's, it's e to 5x dx. Okay, so u is this, and dv is everything else. Okay, <clears throat> now, in the biparts formula, there are four different kinds of quantities, four different kinds. There's u, which is a variable, and there's du, the differential of that variable. So, so far that's two, u and du. What's the other two? V and dv, right? So there's two variables, two differentials, four things. How many of them do we have at present? We have two of them. In particular, for example, we have u. How could we get du from u? Yeah, compute its derivative. So then, what is du? Not one. No. So when you say one, what you mean is du dx is one. That's what you mean. But that means that du is dx. So in particular, it may seem like a technicality, but if you write du is equal to one, that's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong in the same way. It, it's wrong in the sense that these are not even the correct, that the left-hand side is of category differential and the right hand side isn't. So, so under no circumstance could this be right. And I'm not picking on you, I'm just making the point uh, as clear as I can. Even graduate students have got to get on to them a lot of times because they'll do that. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have three of the four quantities. We have u and du, we also have dv. Which one do we not have? v. We don't have v. How do we get v? Right. So we can get v, which is what we want, by anti-differentiating dv. Okay, so we can get v from that. So v is antiderivative of e to 5x dx. Okay, so now, can you do that? Do we know it? So is that one of the antiderivatives that we know? Yeah, it's, it's this one, more or less. So now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, these are the only three antiderivatives we know. This is it. But I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make one minor addition to the table right here and say that there's, there really is kind of one more that we do know, which is to say e to kx, if I put a constant right there, e to kx, like this constant, e to 5x. Right, it would be e to kx divided by k and then plus a constant. So strictly speaking, this red thing that I just wrote is not something you need to memorize, like as a matter of necessity, but it would be, as a matter of expediency, making your life easier, this it would be really good of you to memorize this. So what is, what is the antiderivative here? Very good. So... This would be e to 5x divided by 5. And now, I'm going to wait for someone to say it. Okay, so I'm not going to write plus c. So the reason I'm not going to write plus c yet is that look at the right-hand side of the, of the biparts formula. What, I, what we're doing here, what this computation says, is that the right-hand side is uv minus antiderivative vdu. 
So when we rewrite something, there's still an antiderivative left to do. And the plus z is bound up in this remaining antiderivative. So it's not necessary to write plus c for this one, for this one. So then, what are u and v? Very good. So x multiplied by e to 5x over 5, and then minus the uh, antiderivative of v du, so that would be e to 5x over 5 dx. So I didn't write the plus c here because there's yet <coughs> more antiderivative to do. Okay, well, is this an antiderivative that we know how to do? It is, right? It's just another one of these. So, x e to 5x over 5, and then minus uh, e to 5x over 5, and then over 5 again. So that's over 25, if you like, plus c. Okay, so any question about this one? Any question about it? So the biparts formula is kind of interesting because what, what you're doing is you are given this to anti-differentiate and you're sort of saying, well, okay, I understand you want me to anti-differentiate that, but instead of that, I'm going to do this product and this other antiderivative instead. <laughs> so you're trading one antiderivative for a different one. Okay. So let's have another one. So how about antiderivative of x log x dx? OK. So <clears throat> we want to. Um, anti-differentiate this, so we start at the top of the, of the anti-derivative procedure. In the first place, you ask, is this exactly one of the three known antiderivatives? It isn't. And, and I'll say it again, don't be misled to think that there's only three. There's, three. there's three in this class, but if you go on and you say to yourself, you know what, I like business, since most of you are business majors, and I also like calculus, so I'm going to be a quantitative analyst or whatever, which is a high paid position uh, dealing with money. Well, quantitative analysts have to know, which are usually just called quants, they, they have to know a whole lot about calculus. And I promise you, if you go down that path, you will eventually know more than three antiderivatives. You'll know tables and tables of them, probably. So is this one of the three? It isn't. Is there something algebraic you can do? Like maybe multiply something out or simplify something or something like that. There isn't. There isn't anything that you could do to simplify a polynomial multiplied by a logarithm. Okay? So if there's nothing algebraic, what's the next step in the game? Substitution. So could you do a substitution? Substitution is not going to work because if you were to do u is x, that would literally just be changing x's to u's. So that's all that would happen. If you were to do u is log, log of x, then what's du?
was the derivative of log of x. 1 over x. So we would need a 1 over x somewhere, a division by x. Do we have a division by x? We don't. We have a multiplication by x. So that's like the opposite of what we need. So a substitution is not going to work. Therefore, again, by process of elimination, where are we? By parts. So does everyone see that? The reason why I'm doing this is because just because we, we've done by parts, we're doing by parts right now, does not mean that all future antiderivatives and integrals will be by parts. All that, it, all that it means is that I promise you that a subset of them will be. So you've got to be able to go through the procedure because they're not all going to be by parts. Um, so, but on this one, we're going, to, we're going to go by parts. Now, again, for reasons that I'm not going to share yet, I will share, but not on this exercise. For reasons I'm not going to share, u is going to be the natural log of x. Now, because that's the case, you also therefore know what dv is. What's dv? x dx. And how did you make that determination? Yeah, because it's everything else. So what I want you to, as a matter of foreshadowing, what I want you to see is that if I were to give you a rule to choose u, then that would be a rule to, to choose everything. Because once you've chosen u, dv is simply everything else. So, so that's what I'm going to do after this exercise, is I'm going to give you a rule to choose u. Okay, but for now, I'm just saying u is log x. Okay, so how many quantities are in the biparts formula? How many different things? Four. There's four. There's u and du. There's v and dv. How many of them do we have at present? Two. Okay, so let's find the other two. What can we get from u? du. And we can get it by differentiation. So what is du then? 1 over x dx. Any question about that? Okay. What can we get from dv? We can get v. And how do we get it? Well, that's what it is, but how do we get it? Anti-differentiate. Good. Okay, and yes, I agree. The antiderivative of this is x squared over 2. And I'm not writing plus c because there's yet more, after we do this, there's yet more antiderivative to do, and the plus c is still bound up in that. Okay, then doing that, the right hand side of biparts is uv minus antiderivative v du. So now it's just a matter of plugging these things into that formula. So that would be log x times x, uh, log x times x squared over 2. minus antiderivative x squared over 2 uh, times 1 over x dx. Okay, any question about getting here? So now, this is on some future exercises, it may, you know, when it's, it's not clear what method you're supposed to use, you, you will come to a it's likely you'll come to a place where you've attempted by parts. And it's at this position that you determine whether or not your effort was in vain or not. <laughs> you look at this and say, well, I have to con this is where I have to continue work. Do I know how to continue from here? So do you know how to continue from here? Yeah. So how would you proceed from here?
I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, half could come out. So suppose I do that, then what? I think I think you're saying the right thing. What do you mean? There, very good. So then, so then, making that simplification. So take the half out, perform the simplification, then it's antiderivative of x dx. And so then, is this one of, exactly one of the antiderivatives we know? It is, right? It's the power rule. So then this will be log of x, x squared over 2 minus half of x squared over 2 plus a constant. Any question about this? <clears throat> The neat thing is, or a neat thing anyway, is that uh, what would you get if you differentiated all of this craziness? You get x log x. Right? That's the point. If you were to differentiate this and simplify and everything, you'd get x times log x. Okay, any question about this one? <clears throat> Okay, another one. <laughs> oh no, not another one. Now, now, I've, now I have to tell you how to, how to choose you. Okay. So this is how choose you in by parts. <coughs> okay, so there's a nice, there's, a, there's an initialism. It is L A E. L A E. And <clears throat> these stand for something. L stands for logarithm. A stands for algebraic. And E stands for exponential. So I think I think that the first I think that L and E are pretty straightforward. So this means things like log x, common log x. log base 2 of x, things like this. That's what that means. Okay. The algebraic thing, the primary one that you'll ever deal with in this class anyway, is polynomials. So things like x squared, 5x plus 3, but also also, things like the square root of 4x plus 1. So like algebraic combinations of symbols, like polynomials and radicals and things like this. And then exponential means exponential, like e to x, 
e to 5x, 2 to x, things like this. Okay, yes? Uh, they would be between algebraic and exponential. So, so right, in, right in this slot. But this course foregoes all mention of trigonometry, so. And then the inverse trigonometric functions are at the top. Uh, so, LAE. LAE is the is the initialism. And this is called the biparts heuristic. What does heuristic mean, by the way? Sorry? Well, OK, yeah, so that's what it means in this context. Generally, heuristic means Probably, a, probably a good, a good definition for it would be just like a good idea. So, and you should take it in that way. It's just a good idea. It's not set in concrete. Okay? It's not, it's not a for sure thing. It's just a good idea. So, um, what's an example of a heuristic that that's used uh, in daily life? I don't know. Here's here's a good heuristic. Uh, brushing your teeth twice a day is a good idea. It's not it's not the only it's not the only possible thing you could do, but it's a it's a good idea. Okay. <clears throat> uh, how to because even the dentist right might perform work on you and say, look, tonight you can't brush your teeth. <laughs> to hear your dentist say that, that's kind of like. Whoa, buddy, are you okay? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, on the, on the two ones that we just did, the, the two examples ago, we did antiderivative of x e to 5x. Okay. Then we looked at it and said, okay, we went through the anti-differentiation procedure and we came to the conclusion that, okay, we're going to do it by parts. We're going to make an attempt. So when you come to that place, you look at this and you say, so an another reason why this is a good candidate for by parts anyway is that this is the product of two functions. And remember, what is by, what is the by, what is by parts the inverse of? The product rule. So here we are with a product. So you take these two factors in the product, and then you categorize them. So what category does this one belong to? This is algebraic, so this is an A. And what category does this one belong to? This is exponential. So in the acronym LAE, which one comes first? A's come first, right? A's come before E's. <coughs> So, as a result of this categorization, we're going to choose u to be this one, which is what we did two exercises ago. Okay. Similarly, one exercise ago, it was antiderivative of x times log of x dx. Okay, and then we went through the flow chart and said, okay, we're going to make an attempt for by parts. So that means that what I did, the hidden thing that I wasn't revealing to you, is I looked at these and said, okay, what category of thing is this? It's algebraic. And then what category of thing is this one? It's logarithmic. And which one of those comes first in the acronym, or the initialism, I guess. The logarithm, uh, logarithmic does, so U is that one. 
Okay, good. So any question about this? L-A-E. So can we think of any kind of phrase that starts with those letters L-A-E? I can't think of one. <laughs> What's a word that starts with L? Love starts with L. Love all. I have no idea. <laughs> Honestly. Equations. Love all equations. There we get. That's it. Right? <laughs> Perfect. L <laughs> A E. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it, that's what it is in a different context, even it's eyelate because the inverse trig functions. But with just L, A, and E, I don't know. Um, okay, so let's do one. So the integral from one to nine of the log of 3x dx. So now, notably, we're doing an integral for the first time, not, not an antiderivative. Okay. <clears throat> But of, of course, we want to use the fundamental theorem. So let's just start at the top of the procedure, right? Is this exactly one of the antiderivatives that we know? Is it a known antiderivative? So on this one, there's lots of bytes usually. I can see some of you thinking, it seems to me that I can see it on your face thinking, maybe, maybe it is. So, so here's the deal. Let's just write them down. And I recommend that you do this on all of your quizzes, not on every page, right? Just like on the front or something. Because I'm not going to provide them to you. So you should write them down. So here they are. So those are the, the three. So as for the question that we're, that as for the exercise that we're on, is this antiderivative exactly one of the known ones? It isn't, right? And for, and for those of you that slightly hesitate, usually the hes slight hesitation is because of this rule. Okay? So, here we're doing logarithm, and then this rule has logarithm in it, but I claim that's just not relevant. <coughs> Why is that not relevant? Well, that, that's part of it. I agree that that's a difference, but there's an even bigger and more significant difference. Right. Is that, look, Th this, the stuff that's in between the antiderivative and the different, the antiderivative operation and the differential, that's what's being antidifferentiated. Okay? That is to say, you know how to antidifferentiate things that appear in these red boxes. That one, that one, and that one. So the question is equivalent to asking, of those three red boxes, which of them have a log inside of them? None of them, right? So no, n none of these rules correspond to this, okay? 
could we algebraically simplify something? Not really. There is a minor algebraic simplification we could do, but it wouldn't help us. Because we could use the product, the log product rule, which is to say the log of product AB is log of A plus log of B. You could do that so that you could split this into log of 3 plus log of X. There would be nothing wrong with that, but it just simply wouldn't help you. So it wouldn't have a point. Okay. Can we do a substitution? No substitution will help. So by process of elimination, where are we? By parts. Now, many students get a little bit disturbed here because, because okay, by parts, that means that we need to take all of the things and we need to categorize them. We need to categorize them. And it may disturb you that there's only one <laughs> thing. But that doesn't matter, actually. Uh, but even if it did matter, I could do the following to kind of help you along. So I wrote a 1 there, which is surely a permissible thing to do. Multiplication by 1. So then what kind of thing is 1? What's its category? Well, what I mean is in the LAE categorization, what kind of thing is 1? It's algebraic because it's a constant polynomial. OK. What kind of thing is this, is this one? It's log. Right? So then in the acronym, which one comes first? Well, so, so then what does that tell us? That's you. That's you. Okay, so u is log of 3x. So is there any question how we came to the conclusion that u is log of 3x? Okay, then what's dv? Correct which I'll just write as dx. Okay, so then now, how many, how many uh, types of things, how many kinds of terms are in the biparts formula? Four. And at present, how many do we have? Two. two. So let's find the other two. What can we get from u? Which other one do we get from u? du. du. So, so how do we get du? So by differentiating, right? So what is the derivative of u? Three over three x. What, but what's this? What's this three? How did you get the three up high? Very good. From the chain rule, right? Because the rule is, well, du dx, uh, the derivative of log of just, just x is 1 over x. So the derivative of this would be 1 over 3x. And then, for the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of 3x. And then the derivative of 3x is? three, and then those threes will cancel. Okay. So then du dx is one over x, so that du is one over x dx. Okay. So in the biparts formula, how many of them do we have now? Three, and which one is missing? V, right? V is the one missing. So we can get that by anti-differentiating this. And this is easy enough that I suspect that no one will protest much if I just say V is X. Okay, so if DV is DX, then V is X. 
and no plus C because there's yet more to go. Okay? So what's the right-hand side of the biparts formula then? the right hand side. So I'll write something and you tell me whether or not I have it right. So UV minus antiderivative VDU. So do I have it right? Yes. No, <laughs> I don't. Something's not right about this. something that is once at, that is at once kind of obvious and also maybe subtle something's missing something's not right well i mean I'll eventually have to put in the U's and the stuff and the DB's and whatever. Yeah, that's all got to go in there. But there's something that's missing. Something's just not right. Yeah. What this is not, in, what we're doing right now is integration. And what I really need is the integration by parts formula. What is this? This is anti-differentiation by parts. Okay, <laughs> so, so you gotta pay, pay attention to what's what, right? So then this, this here I need a one to nine. That's how I fix this one. But how do I fix this? The evaluation bar. Right. So all that red stuff there, that's what was missing. <laughs> which is, which is all, all the difference, right? <laughs> okay. So this is, this is integration by parts. For, the, the previous examples were anti-differentiation by parts. Okay. So then this will be log of 3x, uh, so that's u, v, so, and then times x, evaluated from 1 to 9, and then minus <coughs> integral 1 to 9 v du. Now, in such exercises, when you get to this point, before evaluating any further, you should look at this and ask yourself, well, as for the remaining integral, do I know how to proceed at all? And the reason why you have to ask yourself this is because just because you've attempted by parts does not mean that that technique is going to be successful. So, so before we get any further, would you know how to proceed on this one? So is it too obvious or is it too subtle? Because that's usually what silence means. It's too subtle? Right. So run through the procedure, right? Is this exactly one of the ones we know? It is not. <clears throat> is there an algebraic simplification you could make? There is, right? X over X then it would just be dx, okay. So, then 
let's proceed. So this would be log of 27 multiplied by 9 and then minus log of 3 multiplied by 1 and then minus integral 1 to 9. The x and the 1 over x cancel and you just get dx. And so different people think of this in different ways but I just want to make it clear to you the way that I think about it anyway is that this is an integral of 1. So all what this actually is, this is just a fancy way to say I'm talking about the area of a rectangle that has height 1 and base 8. Why base 8? Yeah, that's the difference between 9 and 1. Well, what is the area of a rectangle of, of height 1 and base 8? 8, right? <laughs> base times height. So th this altogether is just a sort of a really fancy way to talk about a, a rectangle. Okay. So this is log of 27 times 9 minus log of 3. And then I guess I'll go ahead and use the fundamental theorem, minus x evaluated from 1 to 9. So then this would be log of 27 times 9 minus log of 3 minus 9 minus 1. And that's the answer. Any question about this one? Okay. <coughs> so, next, how about How about the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared divided by 2x cubed plus 1 dx? I'll let you think about that for a moment. <clears throat> and no blurting out answers, please.
Okay, so for this one, if you got stuck, then you made an error. And I'm going to tell you the error by way of a story. Uh, as it happens today, um, I, I took my, my eight-year-old son to the store to buy a tool because he, uh, he was very well behaved through a certain strenuous situation that I told him I needed him to be good for and, and as a result he got rewarded and he wanted a tool. So we, we went to Home Depot and he bought a set of hex wrenches and he's just really into that. And so, so he's, you know, using his hex wrench on, the, on his, on his uh, scooter and, and everything and he's playing around with it, doing all kinds of stuff and I, I am sure that if I had allowed him to use use it at the at the at the table, he would have eaten with it instead of his silverware. He just was really into it. And that's just a, that's just an example of the phrase that's old. When when what you have in your hand is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if if you attempted integration by parts on this exercise, then you're guilty of that. If you made any attempt whatsoever to use by parts, then it's because you had a hammer in your hand. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go through the procedure. Is this exactly one of the three antiderivatives that we know? Not, not yet, I mean, may, it, like it could be transformed using some techniques, but at present, as the way it's written, is this exactly one of the ones we know? It isn't. So could we perform an algebraic, a sequence of algebraic steps to turn it into one of the ones that we know? There's nothing, there's nothing really algebraic to do, nothing algebraic, because that is, just, that is to say without using any calculus. There's nothing algebraic to do because uh, in the end this denominator has multiple terms so you can't like divide them or anything. There's nothing, there's nothing really that you can do. Uh, so if, if this isn't one of the ones that we know and there's nothing algebraic, what's, what's the next thing? A substitution. That's what's necessary for this one, a substitution. So, in particular, what would be a good choice for you? The denominator, I think, yeah? So the, the denominator would be a good choice, and you can kind of conceive of why the denominator would be a good choice, because the derivative of a degree 3 polynomial is a degree 2 polynomial, and there happens to be a degree 2 polynomial hanging out. <coughs> so if u is this, then du is 6x squared dx. But we don't have 6, uh, so I'll divide by 6. So have we covered everything? Not quite. There's something missing. We've covered all the variables, we've covered all the differentials, yet there's something missing. It, it will do that, I agree with that, but, we've co but there's something that's missing when you make the substitution. We've covered all the variables, we've covered all the differentials. <coughs> But what else? Because this is an integral. The limits. Zero to one. Because a, a, a more verbose way to write this integral is we could write <coughs> this stuff just the same. So x squared over 2x cubed plus 1 dx. And then instead of writing 0 and 1, I'll write from x is 0 to x is 1. That's a, that's a more verbose way to write the same thing. So when you make a substitution, 
these limits, because they're in terms of x, also need to be substituted so that everything goes from x's to the new symbol. Which is to say, what is the u value when x is 0? It's 1, yes. And then what is the u value when x is 1? So what I'm saying is that this denominator is going to be replaced with u. This numerator and differential is going to be replaced with du by 6. And these x limits are going to be replaced by these u limits. Does everyone see the correspondence? What goes with what? Okay, then doing that, <coughs> doing that it becomes integral 1 to 3 and then 1 over u du over 6 And then that division by 6, well, that, that can be factored out as a 1 over 6. And then it's 1 over u, as you said. So is this one of the antiderivatives we know? Yeah, we know this one. So this is, this is log of absolute value of u, 1, 1 sixth, almost forgot that, log absolute value of u from 1 to 3. So now, at this point, some students wonder, they say, now wait a second, I kind of have a sense, I kind of have a memory of having to switch back to x's here. So do you need to switch back to x's? Or, or do you not? And why? So under what circumstances are we switching back to x's? When, when, is, when is that the thing? No takers? Well, again, it has to do with it has to do with the fact that these limits are in terms of x. That's what this is saying. This is from x is 0 to x is 1. What is this? Is that x is 1? No, that's u is 1, right? So there, there's a hidden u is 1 and another u is 3 here. So this here means u is 1, and this means u is 3. So the fact that this thing to be evaluated agrees with u, that means that, no, we don't need to switch back. Now, for those of you that were taught this at a different time, substitution, maybe if your Calculus 1 instructor got that far, yeah, you, you could switch back to u's. There would be nothing nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. If you switch back to, uh, sorry, switch back to x's is what I meant to say. Uh, you could switch back to x's. That would be fine. But then what are the limits of evaluation? The original ones from x is 0 to x is 1. So the question, the answer to the question, when I'm integrating, do I need to switch back to x's? It all comes down to, well, if you switch the limits to u's, then no, you don't need to switch back. If you did not switch the limits, then you do. 
Either one, these are both the same. They're the same. And the reason why they're, they're the same is this is an expression in U evaluated over limits in U. And this is an expression in X evaluated over limits in X. The only place where you go wrong is if your expression is in U and your limits are in X or vice versa. Okay? Good. So I'm not going to do the switchback thingy. I, I, I only wrote this just so I could make that comment. Uh, so then the answer is 1 6th log of 3 minus 1 6th log of 1. But what is the log of 1? Again, a college algebra matter. So what is it? Zero. One sixth log of three. <clears throat> Any question about this one? <coughs> this is okay. <clears throat> okay. So the thing I want you to take away, the, the main thing I want you to take away from that exercise we just did, besides just general practice, is that going forward I make no, I'll make no suggestion on the exercises whether or not by parts is required. The only thing that I guarantee to you is that it's going to be required some of the time. And you can really go astray. And I watch students go astray all the time at this, t at this position in the course where by parts has just been introduced and now suddenly by parts is tried for everything, right? <laughs> I'm gonna try by parts on, you know, on the lock to get into my apartment. Perfect, right? It won't, it won't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, fine, so let's do one more. So antiderivative of, say, x squared e to 4x dx. <coughs> OK. So is this exactly one of the antiderivatives we know? No. Is, uh, can we perform some algebraic simplification, multiplying something or simplifying something? Nope. Can we do a substitution? Nope. Substitution is not going to help anything. So then, by process of elimination, what? By parts. Also, another, another strong indicator, besides the fact that this is the bipart section, which is the strongest <laughs> indicator of all. Okay, another, another good indicator that biparts may be required is that this is the product of two unrelated categories of functions. It's the product of an algebraic thing and an <coughs> exponential thing. Whenever you see this, this is sort of like a contrived situation. This, this would be like, this would be like if, if you walked outside and you saw uh, you know, an American raccoon, which would not be that surprising, but you also saw a zebra. What are you two doing together? <laughs> you shouldn't be here. <laughs> that's, that's like this, okay? <clears throat> so, so, we're committed to trying by parts. Okay, what kind of thing is this? This one, algebraic. And what kind of thing is this one? Exponential. Okay. And then in the acronym, so so what what does this what does this imply then? Very good. So as as a result of this, U is the algebraic thing. 
Okay, then what is dV? Very good. And so I'll say it again just to, just to emphasize that, that the LAE heuristic is for choosing U. But you should also understand that it is therefore also a heuristic for choosing dV because dV is everything else. It's always everything else. Okay, then how many things are in the biparts formula? Four. <laughs> Some of you are saying, I think it sounds like in your head, you've asked that a lot of times. <laughs> well, besides saying, in a math class, besides saying the correct thing, besides being correct, the first rule of teaching is repetition. What's the second rule of teaching? Repetition. <laughs> That's the second rule. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, we can get du. Du is 2x dx. Okay. Then how do we get v? Antiderivative. And then, I, at this point, I hope that this is one that you can do just in your head. You can just tell me the answer now. So what's the answer? Very good. <coughs> and then I'm not going to do plus C because we're in by parts and there's yet more antiderivative <coughs> uh, to do. Okay, so then the right-hand side of biparts is uv minus antiderivative vdu. Okay, so any question about getting to this position? <clears throat> okay, so then now substitute in all the pieces. So x squared e to 4x over 4 minus antiderivative VDU, so e to 4x over 4 multiplied by 2x dx. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead and simplify that because I see that that would be useful. x squared e to 4x over 4 and then minus uh, 1 half antiderivative e to 4x times x dx. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so now here's the, the place where you have to consider was, was by parts the right thing to do? And the answer to that question is do I know how to proceed with the remaining antiderivative? Well, let's think about it. Is this exactly one of the antiderivatives that we know? <coughs> it is not. Can we perform any algebraic simplifications to turn it into one of the ones we know? We cannot. Can we do a substitution? We cannot. Therefore, by process of elimination, where are we? By parts. OK. <laughs> well, what kind of thing is this? Exponential. What kind of thing is the other one? Algebraic. So now, before we get any further to answer the question, do we really have to do it by parts again? The answer is yes, you do. <laughs> that is what is required. Okay. Another thing that you should take away from that realization is that here I've given you an example where you have to do it twice. Please do understand that that means that I can give you an example where you have to do it arbitrarily many times for any number that you like, right? I could give you one 
where it's required 1,326 times. I would never do it, okay? But I want you to understand that in principle, it's possible. Okay. <clears throat> I'll limit myself to two, is, is what I'll do. Okay, so what does that say about the choice for you? U is X. Now, you need to be super, if you're going to use U and V again, what I mean by again is you already used it here. If you're going to use U and V again, you need to be super careful to not confuse the matter of U's and V's. And the reason why I say this is because whenever I give an exercise like this, a certain fraction of students will do the U's and the V's here, and somehow they get these U's and V's confused with those U's and V's. It gets all messed up. So do you understand the, the potential for confusion? Okay, for that reason, I'm going to use S's and T's, which is also possibly confusing, but confusing in a different way. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to say S is X, and DT is uh, E to 4X DX. So then DS is DX, and T is e to 4x over 4. So then, after that um, consideration, this will be x squared. I'm just copying the, that stuff right now. E, e to 4x over 4. And then minus half. And what goes in here, what goes in here is all of this. So in particular, what I want you to see is that in terms of S and T, this is ST minus antiderivative of TDS. That's what goes in that box. This is the second application of by parts. This is that. This half is that half, etc. So this is Okay, then ST, <clears throat> so TDS okay. <laughs> even even another antiderivative to go, right? <laughs> That's fine. So then Uh, I'm going to distribute the half so that it'd be x squared e to 4x over 4 and then this half with that over 4 is over 8 so minus uh, x e to 4x over 8 and then this half distributed here, that negative will distribute and cancel that negative so that this is plus one eighth antiderivative of e to 4x. So now, is that an antiderivative that, that we know? It is. It is, which is, so which one is it? It's the exponential one, right? And notably, do we need to use by parts? <coughs> no, thank goodness, right? That, that, it got old as, as soon as it was new, it got old, right? <laughs> so x squared e to 4x over 4, and then minus x e to 4x over 8. 
Where did that half come from? Oh, right there. And then uh, plus e to 4x over 4, so that'd be 1 over 32, right? So that'd be e to 4x over 32 plus a constant. 32 because there was already an 8 down there. Okay. Any question about this one? Okay. So that's by parts. There's anti-differentiation by parts. There's integration by parts. So now let's just introduce the concept for Tuesday. So this is, there's not going to be, corresponding to tonight's, to, to tonight's homework set, there won't be any questions over what I'm about to say. But I want to get this concept in so that it can stew inside of your uh, brain there for over the weekend. Okay, so specifically, I want you to imagine that that's the, the x-axis, and here we have a rectangle, which is terrific, right? Because we know everything there is to know about rectangles. We even defined what they were. So if this width the base of the rectangle is dx. And what I mean by that is that this is really, even though I drew it this way, this is actually a very skinny rectangle. You can think of it, that's what I mean by dx. And let's say that its height is f of x. Then would you please tell me its area? What's its area? Yeah. F of x dx. But for reasons that I'm not going to get into really clearly, but just sort of vaguely state. So this is, this is the area. It is. But rather than calling the area A, I'm going to call it DA. And you can think of that as just saying that means the area of a really skinny rectangle. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to grab this axis and pick it up and I'm going to start turning it. I'm going to turn it over. And as I, as I turn it, Okay, this rectangle is going to sweep out a certain shape. What shape will it sweep out? A cylinder, kind of like a coin, a, fl a flat one, like a, a really short cylinder like a tuna can, but turned on its side. <clears throat> Specifically, here's that rectangle, and then in perspective view anyway, it sweeps out this shape. Okay, now, let's look at a cylinder in a, in a slightly more common way that you're used to looking at it, like this. So you're more accustomed to looking at them like this, like sitting on the shelf at the grocery store in a soup can. So if this has radius r, and if it has height h, then would you please tell me the volume of this soup can? Right. So the area of the base is pi r squared, right, because the base is a circle. And then if you take a circle and you push it up, then it sweeps out a cylinder. And the volume of the cylinder is how, how far you pushed that circle up. So how far do you push it up? h. So pi r squared h. That's the volume of this cylinder. Well, what's the volume of this cylinder? It has different measurements. 
So what's, its, what's the radius of this cylinder? It's f of x. And what is the height of this cylinder? dx, right? Because again, you're looking at the cylinder sideways. Okay. Then, as a result, what's the volume? It is pi f of x squared, pi r squared, yes. And then what is the symbol we're going to use to represent its volume? dv. So now, what we're going to do next time, I want you to imagine this is like a really, really, really flat coin, but it has a volume. What we're going to do next time is we're going to take functions like this, and then we're going to rotate them <coughs> to make a nice looking lampshade thing. And then we're going to cut this thing into rectangles, and we're going to sweep them around. And each of them is going to sweep around a disk, a, a cylinder. And then we're going to calculate the volumes of these lampshades by cutting them into infinitely many infinitesimal cylinders, and then adding up all the pieces. OK, so have a nice weekend. <laughs>